Welcome everyone to another video. 20 years ago I actually built my own sound card from a print magazine article. The at the time highly regarded German CT magazine. To this Romeo and Julia project they call it. Because one of those is a Romeo card and the other is Julia. So the internal DSP card is called Romeo. And the external analog and digital I.O. board is called Julia for talking with each other and communicating with the outside world. Why have we been so crazy to build an own sound card system? As far as I remember, the total costs were probably around 600 Deutschmark, 300 Euro plus inflation, and uh, maybe even slightly more. At that time, most PCs had sound blaster cards that were not the highest fidelity, although getting better. So these are extremely high-end crystal digital audio converters, 18-bit. So these were at the time the state-of-the-art highest-end 18-bit ducts and analog digital converters. And in the meantime I upgraded the analog digital converter even to a 20-bit pin-compatible version. And the internal card, although using an ISA bus, comes with a relatively powerful, at the time anyway, Motorola DSP. This is a 27 MHz version of the 56K DSP. And the point of this was that you could do real-time effects on this and build high-end effects, digital signal processing for music effects and such. While obviously no game supported this, but the point was high-end development. And although not designed for this, you could also use this for hard disk recording. I never tried that example program though, but maybe we will do this for the videos here another day. So 20 years ago I was in school and that was a state-of-the-art heist and project I've ever done. The sad part is after all the challenge getting the parts together that was not that easy back in the day. Internet was still at the infancy and I had to order this from printed catalogs and, and such and even multiple ones. I think I sourced the components from three different suppliers and even this took many months and even then I could not get all parts and at the end of the day it didn't even work. So for most part it was an expensive learning experience and I only got it working 20 years later because it was in the basement and attic for nearly 20 years and I only got it out of it a year ago. And even then it took me nearly a week of debugging with a logic analyzer and such to actually get it working. I will try to keep this video brief and if people are interested go into more details later. Theoretically we could even DIY project build a much more modern version of this. If there is interest, theoretically we could kickstart some awesome stuff. So for this video I will keep the ISA card out of this. We can also go into more detail of the DSP ISA card in another video. But theoretically you connect this with a like parallel port printer cable here. Now I put this away because the external analog digital board also works standalone or with other devices which is really awesome because this means we can still use it today. For the configuration you have jumpers here, whether to use the external card. Actually you could also connect this to an Atari Falcon directly and maybe even was it the next cube or something. So you do not necessarily need the external card anyway. And nowadays I mostly use this standalone freestanding. So the external Julia card has a balanced analog input here. Balanced connections there. I could go into more details about balanced and unbalanced in a future video. There is balanced analog out here. So here is also a built-in headphone amplifier here. I have connected this wire here. And there is a digital I.O. section for regular SPDIF. What I have done here additionally is only last year because back in the day 20 years ago I only wanted to use the analog section. Nowadays I'm also using the digital section most of the time. So you can either root analog or digital input and you in any case have both outputs running, the analog output here and the digital output here. Back in the day I was not interested in the digital section but nowadays I'm mostly running optical fiber anyway. So for optical fiber I built here myself a Corx to optical fiber SPDIF connection. So with this additional board I also have optical SPDIF in and out. However today for the test I will plug in here the Corx connection. I also have exceptionally Corx input and output. 
Yeah. But with all my other Macs and such, of course, running Linux, I use the uh, optical input there. So how this card works, we have the digital section here. So we have here also clock generators for the frequencies 48K, 41.1K. We have um, a bank of optocouplers that are used for the external connection with the PC because we want to have this electronically isolated. So the external connection is always going through these optocouplers. On this section we have the linear power regulators, just the standard ones, which is why we need a little bit of heatsink to burn this voltage there away. This is a crystal digital analog converter going here to the output stage. And we have the crystal analog digital converter with an input stage. And the analog input section also has an optional 40 dB amplifier laser tuned, Bull Brown here. So laser tuned for highest precision. Input is also summing up the signal for conversion to the non-balanced input. As I said, originally this were 18 bits. However, only this year ordered here this old vintage chip from Hong Kong. So this is a pin compatible 20 bit version. Unfortunately, there is not a 20 bit pin compatible version of the digital analog converter. The 20 bit version has a different output stage configuration and is not pin compatible. The biggest reason why this certainly did not work back in the day is that this linear regulators most likely caused a spike for the most part on the negative 15 volt line. So we have here 5 volt for the digital section, plus minus 5 for the analog section and plus minus 15 volt for the analog output stage. And as far as I measured later, most likely my expensive crystal chips were destroyed, switching it on one of the first times. And this was not even my fault. Even the new replacement chips that I brought last year were unfortunately destroyed relatively quickly. I tracked this down to the negative 5 volt regulator that is running from the plus minus 15 volt output here of the transformer. So this spike switching it on without load caused a too high negative voltage on this crystal integrated circuits and destroyed them relatively quickly. And yeah, I, 20 years ago I did not notice this. I only noticed it doesn't work. Another thing that took me quite some, probably five days to narrow down with a digital scope and such is that these optocouplers here, they are extremely high speed Hewlett Packard optocouplers. And one of them was not switching fast enough for the relatively high clock data line. So even when I replace this to working ones and to fix this spike of voltage, switching it on, I now have a botch resistor there on. Here you see this botch resistor. This is my creation for the fix for this problem. And since I have this load resistor, so just some kilo ohm, just to have always some load on the negative 5 volt line. And since then I have not destroyed a single crystal I see there. So this is more of a fault of this professor who designed this. Actually, I wonder how many people built this from this magazine and um, probably one of the really rare exceptions. And as a child, I, I built this and it's not even my fault that it's not working. So after I also ordered new Hewlett Packard optocouplers, there is a new one I ordered just last year was then switching faster and then I had a stable signal there. The optocoupler problem was also more of a problem of this setup. If you have a freestanding board like this, you would normally not use this optocoupler. They are only for the external data transfer. And even if you jumper this external interface off, it's still running the signals through the optocoupler. So yeah, but now it's fully working. Another part that I could not get back in the day was this digital transmitter here, this pulse transformer. And they had a very compact one here. This was one of the few parts I could not order 20 years ago. I can't even find it today with Google. The only mentioning of this with internet search is nearly only this project. So I have absolutely no idea where you should get this compact um, dual pulse transformer there. And back in the day, as I said, I was not interested in the digital section. However, I now soldered this pulse transformer there. This, are, this pulse transformer is the one that is in the example schematic of this crystal SPDIF receiver and transmitter. And obviously it doesn't fit, so I soldered one with um, banded pins at the bottom. And the other one is here. So as I said, it was designed for much more compact transformer, but you can also make things working a little bit creative and this works 
use, I used it many times already, even with my additional optical board here. This is a very brief introduction. As I noticed, the longer videos are not as popular anyway, and I rather make a second and third video in another month about the external ISA card and maybe even more design work of this. What I wanted to do today is, <clears throat> today I only wanted to give you a brief overview. And also, I have more integrated circuits here from crystals. So these are my original ones, they are burned. And as I said, I ordered new ones and unfortunately only later I figured out this problem with the negative 5 volt rail there. So I unfortunately also destroyed a couple of more ones. The problem is since then six months were gone and now I don't remember which were the defect ones and which are the working ones. And I still had the things lying around and I finally want to dispose them to the e-waste recycling bin. So I will now power it up. Usually I use this board with the optical output of MacBooks, but as you may have seen in my previous videos, the optical input is not working on the old MacBooks or even the Mac Pros on Linux. So for this I have my trusty transmitter efficient synth client here, where I have the PCI card of the Delta 1010 audio board there with, um, with also quarks in and out, because I also want to test the analog digital chip here. So I will finish this video by first making sure it still works, then pulling out the ICs, checking which ones do work and which not. The ones who do not work, by the way, produce a clicking sound. So they got toasted by this voltage and now the thing only produces some digital garbage or something from the remaining transistors that just switch around a little bit something. So, so to test this, as far as I remember, the official test procedure was also to configure this as analog in and out. So the first jumper is base clock, then is divider, four is source digital analog, so this is off should be digital. So this is analog and then enable the 40 dB amplifiers and touching these pins, the human body acts as an antenna enough to generate enough voltage to have some humming noise on the headphones. So plug it into the headphone jack, plug in the power and I have some little bit of white noise. Yep, and it works as it should. Let me try to capture this. So this means these chips are working okay and both the analog digital converter and digital analog converter. And as I said, the signal is right now going from the analog digital converter through all the optocouplers and then to both. As both the analog and the digital output are connected, it also goes out here as you could potentially see to the SPDIF transmitter. So this works. Actually, I could test all the chips like this. Didn't even need the SYN client for this actually, unless we want to play some nice music. So let's test all the ICs and finally throw the non-working ones away. This is another digital analog converter, CS4328. CS4328. Yeah, this one is only making some digital noise. So power disconnected, so this one should be bad. CS4328. Yep, that one is also dead but makes another sound. Probably my very original one from 1998 or so. It's of course really a pity that the not so careful design of this engineer led to all this destroyed chips and money wasted. Yeah. Also dead. Five, three, two, eight. This one has another defect sound. So we need a deck that is okay, so we have only two. So they are all 
burned three from last year and the one from 1998 only two good ones yep still works this one is also okay the analog digital converter This is likely my original one, 5389. That is defect. It's already a bent pin here. Okay, multiple bent pins here. Really loud noise. So, a really loud noise is not good. 5390. These are the two 20 bit upgrades I ordered from Hong Kong the other year. Don't really remember if one is already destroyed. That's, that's why we're testing today. Don't get anything though. It's of course interesting one. Um, the old one produces extremely ugly noise and the new one produces nothing. So let's hope everything still works. Yep, still works. So that means from debugging it 20 years later, ordering new chips also while debugging it and getting it to work, we destroyed so many chips. Um, so original ones and um, so unfortunately we only have three working chips left out of nine, 30%. But um, at least it's fully working now and since I have this botch resistor there also not a new chip died and yeah so now let's tune into the digital connection and listen to some nice music before we end this video. I hope you learned something and found this interesting. Always interesting to read the comments what you like and dislike, what you're interested in and what not and I also hope to inspire more people to do hardware or software yourself and think and create new things. So don't forget to share, like and subscribe and I hope to see you soon for all the next videos to come. To play this back, as I said I have a rather high-end PCI card in there. Also the glorified chip on there is from Veer, but it belongs to a fancy hard disk recording M-Audio Delta 1010 system that has an 8-channel external breakout box that I'm however right now not using. What we are using now is this Corx connector here and um, then we use input is the lower one, so I disconnect my SPDIF thing there and we connect the Corx input there, input there. And we switch from analog input that was pin 4 here and yes I need to build a case and theoretically nice rotary switches or something for nice user selection. I could already play this to the SPDIF output there. And it works. Bass man, Mr. John Evans.